He was the coach who awarded Tyron Woodley his black belt on Saturday. He is my friend and yours, the one and only Dean Thomas is here. Hi, Dean. What's going on, man? How are you? You shaved just for me? I'm amazed. I shaved just for you, man. I, well, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I can't grow a beard. Mine is, is way too gray. I see you got a little gray popping through, too. But yes. mine is way too gray. Yeah, you know what? I just don't have any shame anymore. That's really the difference between you and me. I just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> I ain't there yet, homie. I ain't there yet. <laughs> all right, you still have a youthful smile. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, let me say congratulations. Your impressions of how Saturday went, Darren Till being held to just two strikes, it couldn't have gone much better. Yeah, we're incredibly proud in the camp. I mean, Tyron executed perfectly, and that's the type of uh, uh, performance that we were expecting out of him. I mean, we train a lot, and uh, and and – and we've always wanted that type of performance from Tyron. And I think he delivered it this time with, with perfect execution. And we're just so proud of him. I mean, he did everything we asked him to do. You know, one of the things about being 36 and still this athletic is that you get some of the veteran uh, understanding of the game. So talk to me about this. I saw him coming out and people were like, oh, he came out aggressive, which he did. But it seemed highly strategic to me. It looked to me like he wanted to offensively set the tone right away. He wanted to get right away, not in a Vanderlei Silva sense in Darren Till's face, but to let him know that the offense was going to be coming early and often. And I think it had an effect. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't think anybody expected that. I mean, this is what I'm saying. It's like we, we prepared Tyron to do that in some other fights and it just didn't work out. But when you type, we put that pressure on Darren, I don't think he expected that. You know, you expect Tyron to back up and wait and wait and wait. So we said we, we really need to, to get in his face and make Darren Till work. You know, he, we knew he cut a lot of weight. We knew he wouldn't be able to work for five rounds the way Tyron was prepared to work for five rounds. So we said we need to get to him early. You know, start creating angles and not allow him to get that left hand off. So then that's exactly what Tyron did. He got in his face, took away the angle of the left hand, and everything worked out in our favor. Let's talk worst case scenario where Tyron still wins. What were you expecting from Darren Till? Um, where if he still wins? Right, still wins, but like, but like, but like the worst case scenario inside of a world where uh, he still wins. You know. I I was, you know, if, if Tyron got hit with a couple of left hands, um, that would have been the worst case scenario. You know, he got hit with a couple of left hands and, and still been able to, like, pull out a decision or something like that. Because, I mean, Darren Till is a dangerous fighter. I mean, we were we were pretty pretty concerned about some of the assets that Darren Till possesses. Um, like but, what? But in no, mind, in no mind did I ever think that Tyron couldn't, couldn't beat him based on – you know, the weight difference, the height difference, or anything like that. It was just a matter of being able to execute. I mean, Tyron's a short guy. He he was at a, a disadvantage when it comes to height, but we knew that Tyron possessed the speed to be able to get inside fast. And like I told you the other day, being shorter can help sometimes because you take away some of your target. So with Tyron's foot speed and being shorter, he, he was able to take away that target, and Darren Till was never able to get that left hand off. You know, it was interesting, though, the one time where the height disadvantage really showed itself was when those outside trips were being attempted. It looked like a kid trying to climb a jungle gym. I mean, Darren Till looked yeah, huge yeah. in that regard. Yeah, and, you know, and that was another thing, too. But I, the one thing that people don't realize is Tyron does have long arms. So Darren Till wasn't able to get his hips fully away from Tyron because Tyron has long arms. So he was able to get his grips behind Darren. But... He just wasn't able to get his grips and create the angle that he needed to get those trips off. So, um, and, and Darren Till did the right thing. He, I mean, he's he's not a dumb fighter. He's not a he's not a, a you know a scrub. So he knows exactly what he needed to do. Let's talk about uh, after Saturday. It looks to me like the world is finally starting to come around on Tyron Woodley. Have you noticed that even some of his begrudging detractors are saying, you know what, maybe this guy is better than I thought. Yeah, and I think that people are starting to realize. I think that everybody – here's what I think, Luke. I'm going to be honest with you. I think that people were just upset with Tyron. You know, I don't think that they ever, you know, didn't think he couldn't – didn't think he could fight. I think they were just upset with him because they know what he's capable of. I mean, up until the second uh, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson fight, Tyron was just tearing people up up until that fight. Then those two fights, I think he just disappointed people. 
And they were upset with him. And that's when they started, you know, really bad mouthing him. And the fact that he was coming out and just kind of complaining about his position in the game, I think that really just kind of exacerbated everybody's, uh, you know, view of him and said, you know what, we don't like this guy. But I think his performance on Saturday and his stance now that, listen, I don't care who you put in front of me, I'm just going to fight. I think that's what people want from Tyron. And I think that's what turned everybody's opinion of him around. Yeah, so it wasn't just the performance, right? It was afterwards at the post-fight press conference. They're like, who do you want next? He was really agreeable. He was like basically anybody. It might even be at UFC 230 because he didn't take any punishment. And, you know, every time I call somebody out, people don't like it. I don't blame him for doing that, but I think that's a pretty sober assessment of reality. Did did the criticism ever get to him? Or how, how, did, it, how did it affect him low these many years? I mean, it's always affected him. You know, there's times where... You know, we have to take his phone away from him. You know, it, it affects these guys. These fighters, everybody thinks that they're just, you know, these 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 warriors and these animals. But fighters are some of the most sensitive people that you'll ever see or ever meet. And it affects them. I mean, they get out there and they train their, their tails off and then they get in the cage and they fight. They make themselves so vulnerable for the world to see. And then people just take that for granted and start talking trash about him. And it affects him. It affects him heavily. But I think now is the time where Tyron, is, as his maturity, as he's evolving as a person and a, mixed, and a martial artist, he's starting to become more mature and say, you know what? There, this may be a time where I have to just, you know, give to the fans what they want. And that's for me to just shut up and fight. Hmm. You know, it was interesting in researching this interview. I went back and I watched his fight at UFC 161 against Jake Shields. It was a very, very close fight. It went Shields' way via split decision, but probably could have gone either way. I scored it a draw. Apparently, I looked it up on MMA decisions. Shouts to them. In any event, um, he had a totally different corner. I think it was Laborio and some other striking coach. When did you get involved with him? Well, here's the thing. is like not a lot of people know this, but I've been involved with Tyron since 2006. I cornered him in his last two amateur fights. And then I, – but I didn't become a, a staple in his camp until he fought um, – it was one of his strike force fights. I can't remember exactly which one, but it was in strike force, but I missed a couple of his UFC fights and the fight with Jake Shields happened to be one of them. But, um, I was still always kind of in his corner and, and we trained a lot together, but it wasn't until he started really making money to really provide for me to come out and be his, you know, his main guy, you know, he just couldn't afford to have me out for all those fights. So when did he start to have the ability to afford to, you, you to come out? I know you guys, correct me if I'm wrong, did you guys not have a podcast called D's Nuts? <laughs> yeah, we, we, <laughs> we still do. Okay. And, 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 the story about, and, and here's the thing, we have stickers for that, and Tyron put a sticker on Matt Sarah's back, and he wore it for the entire day. He didn't even know it was on his back. But, yeah, we still kind of have that podcast, but we don't really really exercise it that much. But to answer your question, Luke, we – um. It wasn't until, like, the Rory fight is when I think, you know, I was with him for the whole camp of the Rory fight. And then after that fight, it was kind of, like, understood that I needed to be with him because, you know, he just, a lot of times he just needs to stay focused. And I'm one of the only human beings on earth who could probably keep him as focused as he'll be. You know, he did look focused. You mentioned that these guys are sensitive. I don't think that's exclusive to Tyron. It's a lot of fighters who are that way. And he did look a little bothered by the fact that he was the underdog, but the right kind of bothered, where it was the kind of bothered that enabled him to dial in for this fight. I just felt like um, it's not good necessarily, Dean, to be bothered, but he seems like a veteran at this point who knows how to channel all of that into productive performance. Yeah, and that's what it was, too. He was bothered by it, but it wasn't that he was the underdog. That was never the case because he's been the underdog in the last four of his five fights, so that wasn't the case. The case was really that he knew that you know, he felt kind of pressured into taking his fight. He knew that it wasn't really the right time for him, and it, it might not even have been the right fight for him. But he felt like he was kind of pressured into this fight. So he said, you know what? I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and I'm going to show the world what I'm made of. And that's exactly what he did. That was exactly what he prepared for. And he also, too, and this is one thing that I, I think helped this fight, too, was that he understood what Darren Till was capable of and respected it throughout camp. You know, some of the other guys, you know, were like Damian Maya or even Wonder Boy. It was like we knew that we had that puzzle to solve, but he never really felt like those guys could hurt him and put him away and embarrass him. But he knew that Darren Till, if Darren Till was able to get off, he knew that Darren Till could embarrass him. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to let this happen. I can't afford to lose the position I'm in now. 
the position of that the world treats me, the way the UFC and everybody treats me, I cannot lose this fight. If I lose this fight, I was saying, like, if Tyron loses that fight, he might as well retire. So he, he was in a do-or-die position. Why would he retire if he if lost Tyron the fight? Loses that fight they're going to push him way to the back. He's never. If Tyron loses that fight, they would have never given him a rematch. They would have never. He would have had to fight every top guy coming up. He would have. It would have. His next fight would have been Usman and then Leon Edwards and then Santiago Ponzinibbio. He would have never been in a position to get back to that title. So he cannot lose. Hmm. Uh, you are a black belt in jiu-jitsu under who? Who gave you your black belt? Ricardo Laborio gave me my black belt in 2007. 2007. Did you get it in the gi? Yeah, okay. I trained. A lot of people don't know this about me, but you know, when I had my, own, I had my own, ran my own academy for 12 years, a couple, multiple ones, and I only did a gi program. Um, I, I did not know that you actually had a school. I, I knew you had your school. I didn't know it was for 12 years. Why did you, uh, very quickly? Why did you decide to get rid out of that business? Well, just because you know, I had the opportunity after the t Ultimate Fighter. Uh, Black Zillions versus American Top Team. American Top Team wanted to hire me on full time as a coach, and I figured it was uh, you know I liked working with pros anyway, and and I just said you know what I'm just going to coach full time, and I just gave up my schools and just decided to coach full time. All right, so you got your black belt under Laborio in 2007. Uh, you, obviously, you have a bunch of famous wins via submission in the UFC. Uh, let's just start with the basic question: Why did you decide to award Tyron Woodley his black belt on Saturday? So, and here's another thing, too, is a lot of people don't realize that Tyron trains in the gi as well. I did not and know even that. even if he didn't, yeah, even if he didn't, he's still, his grappling is still up there with the best of them. In fact, I, I told him the other day, you know, I do all the drilling with the guys. And prior to this camp with Tyron, the most vicious guy that I drill with is Antonio Carlos Jr., who's a world champion in jiu-jitsu. Tyron felt worse than him as far as traditionally or transitionally and his pressure and just his ability for control and, and finding submissions. He felt worse than Antonio Carlos Jr. Now, his jujitsu ability is, is it exceeds the black belt level. The reason why I gave it to him was because he was supposed to get it a couple of years ago from Ricardo Laborio. But for whatever reason, it never happened. And I figured it, it would be a good experience for him to actually get this if he wins on Saturday night. So I said, you know what? I'm going to give him his belt if he wins. I knew he was going to submit him. I had no doubt in my mind that he wouldn't submit Darren. So that wasn't the submission I thought he would use, but I knew he would submit him. All right, a couple of questions. What submission did you think he was going to use? I thought he was going to uh, get him in a rear naked choke. Okay. So, so take him down, make him, force him to turtle, and then go from there? Something yeah, like that? Yeah, and you don't, and, and, and in MMA these days, you don't force guys to turtle. They give it to you. You know, most guys just don't know how to capitalize off of it. But this is something that we work a lot on, and that's our sequencing to chokes from that back position. And I figured all he needs to do is give him the angle. And if he got the angle, Tyron would have choked him out. Is the is the Dars something he typically goes to? Yeah, he likes the Dars. I mean, and that's one thing that, you know, as a wrestler, a, you know, he, he's traditionally a wrestler. They have that squeeze. You know, they know how to just bring it in. So, um I knew when given the opportunity, he was going to have the squeeze for that. So that's one of his moves, just personally one of his moves. That's really interesting, though. So you would have given him the black belt. Let's say he that remember that right hand that dropped, Darren. What if that had, like, one punch KO'd him? You still would have given him the black belt? Yeah, I would have given it to him because, like I said, it, and a lot of people are like, well, he just submitted uh, he submitted a white belt. Who, I mean, it's not. it wasn't that victory that secured it. That was just the moment that I wanted to give it to him. So whether he won or not, I would have given him the belt anyway. I see. What did he say to you backstage? If you don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can share the details. Maybe you can just paraphrase. But did he give you any kind of indication? He was saying, I think he told Megan O'Leary he cared more about that than he did the UFC belt. Um, I'm wondering yeah. what you think it means to him. I know it meant a lot to him because I know how much he wanted to be to be a black belt. I mean, Tyron is a traditional martial artist through and through. I mean, he really likes, he really loves doing jujitsu. I mean, and I know how much it means to him to want to be a black belt. And I don't think that he was one expecting it then. And he, and I don't even know if he knew how he would get it at this point, you know, because he's fighting, he doesn't really have a chance to like put the gi on maybe as often as he likes to. And I know in the jujitsu community, that's kind of like the thing that everybody looks for. You have to put the gi on. So he doesn't really get those opportunities as much, but in the most opportunities he gets to train and grappling, is with me. 
Hmm. You know, so you- I'm a third degree black belt. So I'm, I'm, I think he deserved it and he earned it. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that he does. I mean, look, you get these guys who are D1 wrestlers. Forget very good D1 wrestlers like Tyron Woodley. And you know as well as I do, two years of jiu-jitsu on the mat, and they're at a minimum purple belt level. And he said he's been training yeah. jiu-jitsu since, what, 2005 or six. I have zero yeah. doubt that he's a black belt. I, I just sort of wonder, have you ever awarded a black belt, A, to anybody else, and B, in the context of, I know it wasn't because of the MMA fight. The MMA fight was really the occasion but like that, not versus on the mats in front of everybody at jujitsu class. So, so I have four black belts that I've awarded. Um, two of them you wouldn't know. They just are, you know, they were my students from for a long time. Um, and the only other black belt I've ever awarded was Daniel Weichel from yes. Bellator. Yeah. Yeah. You, you gave him his black belt. I did not know that. I did, yeah. And did you give it to him an MMA fight or on the mats? I gave it to him on the mats. Okay, so this is a bit of a unique thing for you then. Yeah, yeah, this is the first time I've ever done this. Wow, crazy. Let me ask you a few more questions about Tyron if I can. Look, I I said this at the outset of the show. I don't know why Dana White was not at the post-fight press conference, and I I hesitate to speculate, um, but here's what my point was. If if he wasn't there uh, because he had some kind of other situation he had to attend to, well, that's a shame, but I could understand. If not, it's just shameful to me. Because you get these big wins like this, and that's the right moment for the head of any organization to come out and pat a guy on the back and tell the world, set the narrative for this. What do you make of Dana White not being there? You know, being on the show with Dana, I know how hard he works. I know his schedule, and I know he keeps everything really tight. So I will never speculate that he didn't show up because he disliked Tyron or didn't want Tyron to win. In fact, when he came into the cage, he kind of gave me a nod and was like, good job. Um I mean, of course, everybody's going to speculate that he didn't like it. But I know, like I said, Dana keeps a very tight schedule. I know that he was leaving. I was talking to a security guy afterwards saying, man, we got a flight to catch. And, you know, and sometimes Dana's just like his schedule is tired all the time. So, like, you know, I don't want to use that as the excuse, but I just know he keeps a tight schedule. So, like, that's the only reason why I could say he he wouldn't be at the press conference. I would like to see him come out with a statement now and congratulate Tyron. That would be good, you know, because – it's easy. It's easy to criticize fighters, but you know when when they show and prove, when they show up and give you what you ask, it's you know I think you it's only right to give them their props. Uh, Tyron Woodley's just an amazing guy, right? Like he's maybe the best analyst on Fox. He's one of the best welterweights of all time. A jiu-jitsu black belt, a family guy. He has a show on TMZ. He pays for his own self promotion. He never gets in trouble. I, I don't know if this is the corner that he needed to turn to get promotion. But geez, Dean, if this is not, I, I have a hard time understanding what might be. Listen, and don't forget about his mix, his, his mixtape he got coming out and the single <laughs> he got dropped with Wiz Khalifa. This You're week. right. So if this isn't the right, I mean, he does movies. I mean, he's one of the most unique guys I've ever met. And like his energy, if people really knew him, everybody would like him because he's so charismatic and charming. But, you know, the problem is, man, it's just hard to get past some of you know, some of what he does at times, you know, he, when he starts to talk, you know, cause like he just, he wants everybody to get on his side and see what he's doing. And it may come out wrong at times. I think that's what it is. We were talking at the top of the show about where he ranks all time among welterweights. You and I spoke about this on Friday. My sense now in looking at the resumes is Matt Hughes has more title defenses and certainly did a lot for mixed martial arts, but I'm, I, it's just hard to say because t- uh, Tyron doesn't have as many title defenses but the ones he has are over fighters who are, for the most part, way better. So after Saturday, where would you rank him? Second or third or something like that? And what do you think he has to do to get into an argument about being the best welterweight of all time? I think, you know, at this point, I, I'm going to have to say second. Um, I think that if he beats, and like you said, I think his resume speaks for itself. When you think of the guys that he has beaten, you know, either, even even in his come up between like Carlos Condit, Kelvin Gastelum, Robbie Lawler. So like all he's beaten all those guys. But I think that a couple of more title defenses will solidify his position. I think that's all he needs. You know, a win over Colby does. I mean, to me, I think Colby's an easy opponent, to be honest with you. But just on the resume, he kind of needs that just so he can have more title defenses. But and maybe even Usman. But if he gets those two, then he's the best of all time. Why is Colby an easy fight in your judgment? 
just because Colby is he doesn't have well first off he he doesn't have anything that's dangerous to Tyron you know he doesn't have the ability to knock him out with one punch if Tyron slips he doesn't have the ability to to choke Tyron out, like to play, take him down, take his back and choke him out. I don't think he has that ability. The, the way Kobe can win that fight is to obviously grind him out. And I don't think he can out-wrestle Tyron to get him to that point. So to me, that's his, kind of an easier matchup. Is that the one you want to see next? And do you think November 3rd, if they make it UFC 230, is that too soon or just you know strike while the iron's hot? November 3rd? Uh, I don't think it's too soon. You know, Tyron didn't take any damage. He's healthy. He's mentally in the right place. I don't think it's too soon. If 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 Tyron can do it, as long as it don't interfere with his rat tour schedule, I think it is. A, <laughs> I think it works. Uh, how how would you rate Tyron as a rapper? G- grade those bars. <laughs> so uh, here's another thing with Tyron. Um, he is incredibly intelligent, and he's a student of the rap game. So he's when he raps, like he he really he, he puts a lot of effort into his lyrics. He's still working on his delivery a little bit, but I mean that's coming with practice. And he can tell you that as he get, as he practices and he's in the zone, you know his his delivery is fresh. But his his lyrics are up there. His, his lyrics are tight. I saw him on Sway freestyling. I don't know if it was a freestyle, but it was pretty good. It was pretty good in the end. Yeah. And that was and that was kind of you know he's gotten he's gotten a lot better since then to be honest with you like he he created thirty songs in a year, wow! And he's always in the studio. He's like that's his release. Like he he likes to just go to the studio and rap. You got to be like DJ Clue on his records where you'd be like, oh no, stop, 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 stop! You got to be that guy yeah, on know, the record. Somehow somehow I got to get in there and be in the background. I don't know how, but somehow I got to do it. Well, you know what? It seems like you guys have an incredible relationship. It was a near flawless victory on Saturday. Dean, you're one of the good guys in the sport. I really appreciate your time today, and I can't say it enough. Congratulations to Tyron and to you as well. Thank you, man. I appreciate it.